All right, it's 9.15, so let's get started with our Sharing Visions keynote session. Trevor A. Dawes has worked in the academic library sector for over 20 years, developing and providing a range of service enhancing training and professional development opportunities that positively impact library-wide projects and programs. He also facilitates workshops on leadership development and diversity, improving the knowledge, skills, competencies, and abilities of librarians and library workers. A published author and presenter, Trevor has written or edited books, book chapters, and articles, and presented on a variety of topics at local, national, and international conferences. Trevor earned his Master of Library Science from Rutgers University and has two additional master's degrees in educational leadership and educational administration from Teachers College, Columbia University. He is the Vice Provost for Libraries and Museums and the May Morris University Librarian at the University of Delaware. Following Trevor's presentation, I will ask him some questions about issues he brings up, and then we will open the floor to audience questions. Please use the Q&A feature to get your questions into the queue. And now, without further delay, we are privileged to welcome to our conference, Trevor A. Dawes. Thank you, Trevor, for being here. Good morning, and thank you, Zach. And uh, if I could just ask, um, our host to enable my screen share, that would be great so that I could share my presentation. Wonderful, thank you. So good, um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Zach, and everyone for being here. And allow me to add um, my welcome to the inaugural Sharing Visions conference. I'm really, I'm really delighted that so many of you have gathered here to discuss the current trends and issues in resource sharing and to take uh, the time to start your day, uh, your day with me. I'm sure that you are the embodiment of our collective commitment to advancing learning and transforming scholarship in your respective institutions. And I trust that the time that you spend here with your colleagues will prove fruitful in reshaping the fantastic work you do every day at your institutions. You know, we can call it perhaps pandering that I chose this background for um, uh, my session today. I use a lot of images from the library at the University of Delaware. And this image obviously happens to be one of our um, in a library loan, um, in a library loan uh, office. And so I thought I would share uh, that as my background. I wanna take a moment though to acknowledge um, the land uh, from which I am making this presentation in Delaware. So we do recognize that the land on which the University of Delaware sits today and occupies today as the traditional home of the Leni, Lenape, and Nanticoke tribal nations, the Delaware nations. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering. So we take this opportunity to thank and express gratitude to the original caretakers of the land. We do strive to hold space and value the perspectives that the tribes share regarding their histories, their cultures, their traditions, and most notably the power of their languages. Together, let us learn more about the indigenous peoples and places we live and visit. And let us explore how we might build relationships with sovereign tribal nations that lead higher education and our broader, our broader communities to be inclusive spaces, fostering innovation and collaboration. I invite you to take the time to learn more about and to acknowledge the ancestral peoples of the land where you are also. Thank you. As you know from the introduction, 
I'm Trevor Dawes, the Vice Provost for Libraries and Museums at the University of Delaware, a position that I've had for just over four years now. These days, it seems like I've been there a lifetime is what we've been talking about at, at UD as you know, COVID years has only been a few months, eight, uh, eight months. I imagine it is probably the same for many of you at your institutions. It's interesting that uh, when I initially began speaking about this conference with the organizers, with Chai Chin and Zach, um, you know, we were talking about the future of resource sharing and who knew that we'd be so, so reliant on resource sharing and similar services or service that have adopted the principles of resource sharing in order to have materials be delivered or picked up in the ways in which we are providing these services uh, today. Whether, and I'll come back to that in a moment, whether it was clairvoyance or wishful thinking, or maybe just an observation, um, to think about planning an inaugural resource sharing conference at a time when this service is definitely on an even faster meteoric rise than before, I think is really critical. I had planned to share some thoughts about how libraries adapt to change and specifically about some of the changes in resource sharing and the inherent trauma that is associated with change. Of course, these days, one cannot have a conversation about change without addressing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of us are still experiencing and perhaps even still planning for the future of our organizations in light of the pandemic. Um, and we'll certainly have the opportunity to discuss those during the Q&A session, uh, the Q&A portion of the session. I should also advise that is intent, it is intentional that I have minimal, minimal slides. We've all been working in the virtual environment, whether wholly or in part, uh, for the last several months. And I'm sure that you all are, as am I, suffering from Zoom or Teams or WebEx or online platform of your choice uh, fatigue by now. I hope that by not having too many slides, the format of this morning's talk will be more intimate and perhaps more conversational, and we have more opportunities for engagement. Um, Zach mentioned that he has some questions that are prepared. Um, so my, my portion of the talk will be relatively short, about 20 minutes, and uh, then we'll get to some uh, Q&A. Before continuing, also inv I invite you to join me for a moment of silence to acknowledge the many black and brown people who are no longer with us due to the structural and systemic racism in our country. Unfortunately, there are too many names to mention, but some of the names you probably heard recently include George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Michael Brown, and Walter Wallace. So let's take a moment to honor these people. Thank you. So when we think about change in libraries, there's so much that we could immediately describe. We've seen changes in technology, changes in workflow, changes in organizational structures. Certainly, we've seen changes in leadership and leadership styles, just to name a few. So with change being the practically the only constant in our organizations, one would think that we are accustomed to it by now. But here we are talking about it and in a rather significantly different ways um, than we had been previously. And for many of us, as I mentioned, or and, and has been mentioned, the impact of the pandemic has been almost devastating. However, it, it has also led to creativity and innovation in the ways in which we develop design and deliver our services. Although my talk this morning is titled, Is True Resource Sharing Now a Reality? I acknowledge that I am in a room 
a Zoom of resource sharing experts and, and perhaps some others. And you can probably answer this question much better than I. So with that in mind, I'd like to get uh, a, a sense of um, you know, who's here in, in the room. I see we have uh, 150 participants, but um, just for me to get a sense, I wanna ask a, a few questions, uh, three questions. Um, and if you could use the uh, raise hand feature in um, the Zoom function to answer the, the questions, that would be appreciated. If you're unfamiliar, if you select the participants button, um, the raise hand feature will be one of the options on the participants box. So my first question, how many of you um, have resource sharing as at least a part, if not the primary role in your current position? Okay, wow, all right, that's what I suspected, thank you. <laughs> uh, you may lower your hands, great. Um, now the second question, um, this is really to figure out where resource sharing is situated within your organization. So is resource sharing unit located within a broader access services department? Uh, raise your hand if that is uh, the case. And this may apply more to academic libraries than public libraries but, or other types of libraries, but still a fair amount. Great. Um, thank you. And I asked specifically about access services, because if you work in access services, um, you'll probably know the answer to the next question, but I wanted to provide some context before asking it. I made reference, of course, to change being the only constant in libraries, and we certainly have adapted to changes in many ways. But when we think about or speak about um, changes, it seems logical to have some understanding of the challenges that we face in our libraries that often inspire innovation or lead to change. You know many of them, some of them as well as I do, as we all live through them. And these might include, um, oops, these, um, Sorry, I forgot about my slides. These might include uh, defining customer service metrics or the impact of technology on library work, determining how and what to measure from a statistical perspective, or even the privacy of patron records. So I identified these from the book, Circulation Work in College and University Libraries by Brown and Boosfeld, who were at the University of Illinois at the time that the book was written and a book that I came across when I was doing some research for one that I wrote, uh, co-edited recently. Is anyone here familiar with the book? Raise your hands. Great, one person. So you cannot answer the next question. Um, <laughs> but does anyone care to uh, guess when this book was published? And uh, you can uh, type the quest, the response in the chat if you think you know when this was published. 2001, 98, 88, sorry, um, 85, 80, yeah, I got that, <laughs> all right. Well, um, so this was published by the American uh, 2017 by the American Library Association in 1933. And so here we are more than 80 years later, still facing many of the same challenges as libraries faced more than 80 years ago. And this has led to, I believe, many of the changes that we've had hopefully has led to many of the changes that we've had um, since, 19, since 1933. But today we face additional challenges, right? So the four that I just mentioned, but we also have the challenges of accountability and assessment. Um, thinking about the ways in which our library's physical spaces need to change, even more of a challenge these days, um, one that we hope is very temporary. 
the need for our staff to develop and enhance different skill sets to meet the changing needs of our user populations. Of course, our budgets, which may continue to either shrink or at least grow at a much slower rate at which they did previously. Um, issues of systemic racism and other forms of discrimination, not only in our libraries, but in the broader society. And of course, today we're dealing with uh, the COVID-19 the COVID pandemic. These are but a few of the challenges that we face, but ones that also provide us with the opportunity to think about and develop new and creative ways to continue contributing to the success of our community members, however that community is defined based on your library type. So I'm not going to address each of these, each of these challenges. You're all dealing with them or some of them and others in your respective places. But I will spend a few minutes discussing a few of them and how they may have an impact on resource sharing now and, and in the future. Our library spaces, and as you can tell, I like to showcase um, the University of Delaware libraries in, in all of my images. So I think our library facilities can be described as perennial trendy spots. Um, and I use trendy not in a derogatory way, but because we're always thinking about new ways to reimagine our spaces. And this is work that is constantly modified. Uh, our spaces are constantly modified in order to meet the needs of our users as the needs of our users change. So prior to March of this year, library workers would discuss how spaces would be or could be more inclusive, how to incorporate new services or programs. These could have included technology, maker spaces or family rooms or prayer or reflection rooms, just to name a few. Of course, now we have to think about physical distancing and limiting the uses of our spaces to maintain the health and safety, not only of our staff, but also of those who use, uh, of those who use our spaces. What will our spaces look like a year from now is still a question. Um, we're certainly thinking about the spring semester for us at the University of Delaware, as are you in academic libraries, and, and what that will mean, what, what, what will happen. And those of you in other types of libraries are still are also dealing with the same issues of thinking about what your space and planning for what your spaces will look like in, 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 next, in a week from now or, or months from now. Staff skills. So not only do we have to rethink our spaces, we need um, to challenge our staff to do new things or to do things differently. Oftentimes, this new work will require different skills. I have been speaking for years about the need for library information science programs, but also professional development programs in general to help develop the next generation of library workers and to help reskill those who currently work with us in libraries and information centers. Today, some of the skills are even more important as the ways in which we interact with our users is so different. While this is not an exhaustive list, I, I argue that some of the skills we need to work in libraries today include you know, project management. Some of us may be familiar uh, with space planning, for example, but as we engage with researchers on large scale projects, how can we help to lead their projects um, which requires a different set of skills. Instructional design and instructional technology skills are critical, especially as we embed ourselves in the teaching and learning mission of the university, or as we had to pivot to um, online uh, delivery of our services, our instruction, our workshops, all of, a lot of the work that, that we do, and we will continue to work in this online environment for some time or hybrid environment for some time. Digital information management skills, our proficiencies are important as we work on more digital projects. Um, in the humanities and social sciences in particular, um, again, there's such a need, there's a need to digitize and make resources available in electronic formats. And although um, many of these you'll, you, you might think apply primarily to the academic library, which of course is my background, I think there's uh, applicability to the broader library community as well. Data analytics and data visualization uh, skills. 
Um, some libraries will already have data analyst or collection strategist or somebody who helps with, uh, with uh, presenting, organizing, collecting, analyzing, and presenting data in, in helpful ways. Um, one of the ways in which you can help to tell the stories of your libraries um, for, for funding purposes, for your, for, to, to your donors, to your boards, to your uh, trustees, to your provosts. Um, you know, telling stories with, with images and data is, is extremely helpful and vital and helps with the ability to make data-driven uh, decisions. Technology and programming skills, I probably don't need to say much about that. Um, this is certainly not new, um, but continuing to enhance our te technology uh, skills uh, remains critical. Um, and assessment. In libraries, as libraries, and certainly in, in higher education, come under scrutiny, remain under scrutiny for demonstrating their value. How we assess our collections, our programs, our services to demonstrate the value becomes even more critical. So related to data management and the data analytics skills, um, we want to be able to demonstrate how we're contributing uh, to the broader society, and we do that through assessing what we do and pivoting and making changes as appropriate. And communications and marketing skills are necessary for us to effectively communicate, effectively tell our stories, right? Everything we do, we should be able to um, speak uh, eloquently, speak articulately about, about those stories. I'm sure there are other skills that you can think of that are new or still developing um, or that we need to develop in, in our libraries. Um, and, and these are just some of the few that I have been advocating for and really pushing for certainly in every place uh, that I have worked. But all of this, you know, reconfiguring our spaces, reskilling our staff, developing new or modifying services um, comes at a cost. Many of our libraries and institutions um, were experiencing budget declines um, that only became exacerbated by the global pandemic uh, this year. Managing the pandemic necessarily shifted a lot of our resources to supplies and services related to maintaining the level of service, uh, maintaining our level of operations. And of course, not all institutions uh, felt the impact the financial impact to the same degree, but no one was unaffected um, by uh, in financial terms by the pandemic. As the number of COVID cases appear to be on the rise again, there's a looming question, of course, in addition to the health concerns of the country, um, of what the continued financial impact uh, will be on our places of, of employment. I certainly don't know if any of us have the answer to that question, but the budgets and reskilling of our staff and managing our spaces are not the only issues that we face today. Um, we do have to think about um, uh, where our resources are coming from and also how we are spending, uh, spending those resources. But these are not um, the only issues that we face, right, in, in libraries or in the broader society. We've reached another turning point in race relations in the United States and have begun a lot of conversations about anti-racism and how we can ground our services in anti-racist in anti uh, policies and practices. I won't take the time in this session to define anti-racism because I can see from the website of several of your institutions. And although I grabbed this image from the library at Princeton University, it is one that I had seen on the website of several of the institutions um, that are probably represented here, including the University of Rhode Island and some of your anti-racist uh, initiatives. So I know that you've been having the conversations that many of us have been having at our respective institutions about anti-racist practices, how to build collections that are, are, are broadly representative, how to eliminate or significantly reduce um, bias in the ways in which we provide services, in the ways in which we communicate with our user population. With colleagues at another institution, we at the University of Delaware will embark upon an anti-racism audit within our library and the library, this other institution that I, I cannot yet name. Um, and at this point, 
Um, but we hope to have the first part of our audit complete within the early part of 2021. And we'll be able to share the results uh, broadly and invite other institutions to participate in the subsequent steps. However, the important takeaway from these conversations about anti-racism is that when we look at our services, our programs, our practices, our policies, our communications, our hiring practices um, through an anti-racist lens, it improves our services for everyone. This enables us to strive for the type of services that are equitable for all of our user populations, irrespective of their background. And as libraries have always considered ourselves to be welcoming and inclusive spaces, uh, this will go a long way in demonstrating the value that, that we value what we say we do. This has been an extremely challenging year. We've been trying to address issues of racism and other forms of discrimination in our spaces. Um, this year, however, brought us also the global um, COVID-19 um, pandemic. We've all been living and working through the pandemic, so I need not tell you about the impact it's had on our operations um, as we move to different, to different service models over the last several months. We've certainly seen an impact on our spaces. We've seen an impact on our staff and the need to reskill. At the very least, everyone has had to become proficient in Zoom or whatever online meeting platform uh, you're using. And we've certainly seen the impact on our budgets. But what has been the impact on resource sharing? How do you manage this particular operation? When, do you, when, when you may not have physical access uh, to the material that is often needed um, to fulfill uh, your, your roles. At a time when our users are more dependent on su such access and particularly on access to digital content, whether it be born digital or digitized. So I'll start with the platitudes, right? I mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm here uh, in front of our interlibrary loan office at, at the University of Delaware. And in a library loan always gets, always gets unsolicited positive feedback from our, our users. I'm sure many of you experience the same. It's a service that once people find out about it, they can't seem to stay away from it. Um, it's also a service that at least in academic libraries, we've been touting a lot more, particularly as we rely more on access to content from our colleague institutions. For decades, the idea of the collective collection has been bandied about, and we're finally beginning to see that happen in pockets. Many of you are probably familiar with the Too Cool Project, Too C-U-L uh, project, between the libraries at Columbia and Cornell uh, universities, or the relationship between Georgia Tech and Emory, or the RECAP project, a joint collection of Princeton Columbia, Princeton and Columbia University Libraries and the New York Public Library. These are but examples of some shared collections. There are also large scale shared collection projects like EAST of which I suspect at least some of you are members. And it is, it is through the advancements of resource sharing that we can move forward with these initiatives. At my library, as I'm sure is the case at many others, Resource sharing obviously requires the cooperation um, of others. And so we've moved quickly to delivery of even more electronic material during the first few months of the pandemic. And we continue, we continue to do so today. These actions would suggest that the answer to my question posed in the title of the presentation is yes, true resource sharing is here. But I would ask though, what more could we be doing in resource sharing? We have several cost models where some institutions um, absorb the cost, whereas others pass the cost on to their users. Different systems that don't often interact, interoperate with each other, and several systems under development, at least one of which I know you'll be hearing about later today. This drive for continual improvement suggests to me that as wonderful as the service is, and it is, uh, we can do better. At the University of Delaware, we just canceled, for example, our subscription to our Elsevier bundled package. 
I suspect we'll see an increase in ILO requests as a result. And we're prepared for that. But our researchers are accustomed to simply clicking on a button and getting the article they need. Why should they now have to click three buttons to get that article via interlibrary loan? Hypothetically, how can we embed the ILO functionality into our everyday academic routines and still with the holdings, checks, and user authentication and author authentication and authorization, and without a fee to the user, we don't pass the fee on to the user, and with all the st statistical data that we want to have? I don't know. Maybe that's a possibility one day. In terms of the services we provide, there's no question that it meets and often ILL uh, meets and, and quite often exceeds the, our, our users' expectations. But not being an expert in this area as you are, I'd really love to hear from you about what's coming down the pike and how we can make what is uh, already a great service even better. And do, yes, we're making true, and, and yes, we're making uh, true advances in making seamless resource sharing a reality. But what more could or should we be doing? I look forward to the sessions um, that are going to be presented today. And I'll, and, and I'll leave you with that question because you are the experts um, and, and I'll be joining some of the sessions to hear uh, some of the answers to that question. So thank you so much for um, spending some time with me uh, this morning. And um, I look forward to, to your thoughts, your comments, your questions, and, and to spending uh, more time with you today. Thank you very much, Trevor. Thank you for sharing such insightful information and frankly, some, some moving remarks with us this morning. So I hope that we can now spend some time talking in a bit more detail about some of these issues. I have some questions for you. And, then we will open up the floor to questions from the audience. And just a reminder to everyone watching, please enter your questions for Trevor in the Q&A feature. You should be able to see that if you hover down at the bottom of the Zoom controls. So if you don't mind, Trevor, I'd like to start with something a bit more on the personal side. Self-care is a buzzword these days, but it's become increasingly important and something everyone can relate to. With all that is going on, I'm wondering, how do you take care of yourself so you can function effectively for yourself, your family, your library, and library staff? Um, you know, <laughs> that's, um, that's, a, that's a, a very um, sort of challenging question because I, I, I have this conversation, you know, I, I, I talk with at least one member of my family every day. And I keep telling them, you know, I work 24 seven, 365. And so I got one day off this year because it was a, it was a leap year. Um, and, and I know many of us, uh, you know, sort of have that um, work ethic where we feel we need to be working all the time. And, but but it, it, it's also important to, to take some, to, it's, it's important to take some time off and, and, and really just sort of force yourself to do that. And so whatever it is that you, you enjoy doing, and I know that's very difficult to do, some of the things that you may enjoy doing may be difficult to do, um, have been difficult to do for the last eight months. Um, you know, I love to travel. I had the last time I was on an airplane was March 8th. You know, clearly that's something that I will not forget. Um, and, and I don't know when I'll be on, on an airplane again. But, um, you know, I can still get in my car and go for long drives, you know, and, and, and see the, the beautiful fall foliage. I'm fortunately in an area where I can do that, right? Um, or I, I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time just chatting with friends and sometimes not on Zoom or on FaceTime because I don't want to spend, you know, even more time on the screen. Um, We've, we, we've developed a little, you know, my bubble of people that, um, that I, I spend, you know, sort of physical time with because that physical contact um, is still important. Um, and so you, 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 you find the people that, um, you know, whether it's your family bubble or extended family bubble, um, including friends that, 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 that you want to do. And then, you know, find something fun. For me, um, you know, one of my friends told me about this karaoke app, Smule, that I, with which I was not familiar until a few months ago. And, um, you know, I probably shouldn't, you know, say that between May and now I've, 
you know, sung over 4,000 songs on SMIL, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, end of the day, oh, done with work, I'm gonna SMIL. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, but I, I also take, take some walks just to get some fresh air. So, you know, whatever it is that you find, um, you know, to, to relax or enjoy. I've also been using the, you know, this is perhaps a promo for the Calm app, C-A-L-M app. Um, you know, I've, I found that to be very helpful. I use that every morning and, and at night. You know, there's some bedtime stories that I that I listen. Well, I say I listen to, but I always fall asleep before the story ends, so I have no idea how any of those stories end. But it's you know whatever. What um, I, I think it's that, that's a very personal um, question, as, as you noted. And so whatever it is that that brings you joy, um, you know, singing, walking, hanging out with friends, watching TV, you know, whatever it is, just just make sure you take the time, make the time, take the time to do that. That that's really important. Well said. Um... I'll be there tomorrow. All right. Um, and of course, we are all in this sort of reactionary mode because of the pandemic. So, so I'm wondering, could you talk a little bit more how resource sharing has changed at your library because of the pandemic? Sure, yeah. So, you know, we, we had to, um, you know, we, uh, in, in Delaware, we were sort of, it was an interesting case at the University of Delaware because the first seven cases of um, COVID in the state of Delaware were all at the university. And so, um, you know, we, we had to shut down sort of, you know, we were working one day and the next day we weren't. And so, um, you know, all operations uh, ceased across the campus. Um, and, and, you know, as we begun to, as we began to sort of figure out, you know, what our new working environment is going to be like, um, you know, in a library loan obviously became uh, one of those functions that we, we still needed because our, our, you know, classes continued, our researchers, um, you know, although they weren't on campus, were still doing work and we still, you know, wanted to meet our obligations to our other resource sharing partners. And so we began with a lot of electronic, you know, access to electronic resources. We, we have, um, you know, access to a lot of electronic resources. So, you know, doing, doing that. Um, once we were able to safely get back to campus, then, um, you know, we, we picked up um, in a library loan was one of the, the few services, you know, and the pickup service, et cetera, but ILO was one of the services that, um, you know, we started up with, with, with again, um, again, recognizing that not only were our users who were still in a distributed way and, and working in distributed modes um, needed access to information. So we use the interlibrary loan like service um, even in, in circulation, um, but we used Iliad, we are an Iliad site um, currently, so to, to manage um, shipping items out to our, um, our own users even, um, so we could keep track of the, the items that, that we were circulating. So in a light, the, the re, our resource area operations sort of set the model for um, some of our other services within, um, within the library as well. So, and we'll probably continue with that for as long as we're working in a hybrid environment, which we still are and, and, and expect to be in the spring as well. Yes, and I'm sure I'm sure we'll all be adapting to to whatever comes next in that regard. Um, but one of the most difficult things I think is is it's not always easy to know how um, to best meet the resource sharing needs of underserved and marginalized members of our community. So I'm wondering, has your library been doing any work related to equity, diversity, inclusion, social justice, et cetera? You've mentioned some of that already. But more importantly, what ongoing role can resource sharing play in those efforts? Sure. So, um, with um, not specifically with resource sharing, but um, the library works with our Blue Hands Success Collaborative. We're Blue Hands at the University of Delaware. Go Blue Hands! Um, and um, our Blue Hands Success Collaborative is our initiative to help our students, our underserved, traditionally underserved students. Um, to succeed at the university. And so that means additional tutoring or personal advising or you know, counseling services. It's, it's the, the range of services that are provided by, um, provided to, um, and I live near a hospital, so this happens all the time, sorry. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the range of services and, um, and the library is one of the, the sort of referral points uh, through the, our, the Blue Hen Success Collaborative. And so um, through that, if one of the needs of the student is, you know, 
material from the library, um, then you know we would get that material to them, whether it's something that we own locally or something that we need to get by in a library loan. So why not specifically a resource sharing concern? It is a, a concern of the library that all of our all of our students succeed, and so we we do work with 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 them. Um, with on a broader scale, though, you know, we we I mentioned the anti-racism audit that we are about to undertake, and so we're really looking at, you know, how we communicate with our our community. What what barriers do we set up in our practices and our policies, and you know, maybe even in our resource sharing policies. I don't know. We haven't begun to look at them yet, um, in, in systematically. But looking at you know all of the things that we do. Um, through this anti-racist lens to see how we can um, be more effective in, in creating the welcoming um, environment that we want to see where all of our students can thrive and be successful. I'm looking forward to learning more about that audit. And I know that many institutions are or, or should be conducting similar audits of their own. Um, so here's more of a visionary kind of question for you. Uh, I wonder if, if you've been spending any time thinking about the role that non-library entities could potentially play in expanding the range of resource sharing materials and services that, that libraries provide. Of course, without getting into any of the very complicated logistics of how that all would work, uh, do you have any thoughts about whether those kinds of partnerships are feasible? So um, by non-library entities, you mean? Um, for example, um, you know, other uh, departments in the university, other uh, cultural institutions in the community, um, other government agencies, whatever might uh, might work. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think um, the, the short answer is yes, right? So what, what we want to do is um, make sure that if there is a need for material by a member of our community, that we can fill that need. And so if um, that comes from uh, a governmental agency, if it comes from a, a local museum, you know, um, now, of course, you know, you mentioned the, the, log the logistical aspects. And, and so, um, you know, but even within libraries, we, we face that logistical um, issue with, with special collections. Right, and so um, you know, we are at, at UD, for example, a member of um, the what was RLG. You know, Maureen will remember. Um, you know, what what was the research libraries group um, now shares? I think within OCLC and um, a, a group of libraries that have committed to um, lending uh, material from our special collections. And, and so that obviously has to have a different workflow than the materials from our general collections do. So unlike you know, the materials that just get picked up and you take it home and you know, have what, do whatever you, you, you know, whatever happens with it when, when it's at home, you know, these materials are used within the library under the supervision of someone in our special collections. And so if, if it's material that requires that type of um, oversight or a different type of workflow, then you know, we'll work that out with the lending agency, with the, with the lending agency. But I, I think our goal should be to ensure that the needs of our community member um, is met. And maybe that can't be through in a library loan. Maybe sometimes that'll require a visit or a digital image scan, or, you know, it's, it's, uh, there, there are different ways in which that need can be met potentially. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good point, but uh, uh, hopefully there's some promise there. Um, I'm wondering how the needs of library leadership have changed in our current circumstances. What kinds of adaptations do library leaders need to be prepared to make given everything that libraries, library staff, patrons and communities are going through? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I hope it's not a change in leadership styles. Um, certainly I hope it wasn't a change for me. Um, I'd have to ask the staff at the library, but um, you know, to be more empathetic, um, and uh, that's certainly needed uh, at this time. Um, uh, you know, but I think some of the skills that I described uh, as being necessary in libraries also applies to some library leaders, right? You know, not 
um, all of us. And, and, I, and I think about leadership throughout the organization, not just people in titled positions. So, um, you know, the skills that I made reference to, to varying degrees uh, would certainly apply to library leaders as well. But, but I think, you know, the, the primary thing that I would say, I hope more leaders are displaying, particularly these days, is empathy. Yes, very important. Um, well, I think I'll, I'll ask you one more question of my own and then we'll open it up to the floor again. Just a reminder, you can put your questions for Trevor into the Q&A uh, feature in the bottom of the Zoom menu control. Um, Trevor, if money, technology, logistics, all those other limiting factors were not an issue, what's your wildest research, resource sharing fantasy? What do you wish could happen in the world of resource sharing that is not currently happening? Um, so I, I, I may have answered that in, in, in the, the last point of the presentation that, so let me, you know, I, I think um, you know, it's, it's really about resource sharing as all of the services that we provide in libraries is about the user, right? And so from a user perspective, really enabling seamless access um, to the content that the person needs. So, you know, I'm doing some research here at my computer. I want to be able to um, immediately, you know, just get access to that thing that I needed, um, that I need uh, without having to, you know, fill out a form or, um, you know, oh, I've got to log into something else or, you know, step away from what I'm doing to do something else. Now, you know, this is, um, uh, you know, that, that's, that's, that's my pipe dream, I guess, that, you know, requires a lot of um, programming and development, you know, maybe that's inserting a chip in our brains or, I, you know, I don't know, <laughs> you know, that, that, we, that, that will enable us to do that, um, I'm obviously kidding, but, um, you know, I, it's, it's really about, it's, it's about, it has to be about the user and making sure that um, they can get what they want. And, you know, I, at the same time, I'm a little torn about that because, um, you know, I think we have become so successful in providing uh, access to electronic content um, to our users that oftentimes they don't realize that the services of which they're taking advantage are services that are provided by the library. Um, and so, you know, while I'm often loath to use the word branding, um, you know, we need to remind our community members that, you know, this is a vital service that is being provided to you by the library. So while, you know, you may only click a button or three buttons or however many clicks you have to make um, to, to get access to whatever it is, then this is a, a valuable library service. Um, and, and we just want you to remember that. And, and it's hard for me to separate my, you know, sort of leadership and need to get funding role from, so I have to keep thinking about that. And, and that's the, the root of that part of the answer to that question. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to open things up to questions from the audience. Uh, and I want to welcome and thank our Q&A moderator for this session, Dawn Laval from Connecticut State Library. So again, if you have any questions for Trevor, please put them into the Q&A. So there is a um, sort of more of a comment, but you know, that ILL can participate in anti-racism by evaluating lending fees, yes. You know, and and but that's 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 not a simple proposal, right? Because, um, you know, there's a there's a cost in a library loan, and 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 so someone has to pay that cost. For some libraries, it's some libraries may not be able to afford to um, uh, absorb that cost in their operations as is the case in, I would say, many, if not all, academic libraries. 
uh, although some academic libraries do pass the costs on or costs even above a certain threshold, they, they'll pass those costs on to their users, but those fees can be a barrier um, to access to that content. And so as we think about and look at um, all of the barriers that we put in place, yes, the costs certainly have to be um, one of those. And if your library is able to reduce or eliminate those fees to the user, then that would certainly go a long way towards equity in, 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 that, in that library or in that system. And of course, um, the whole aspect of, of the sustainability of, of delivery um, plays into that as well. And uh, we will be talking about that more at the end of the day. Do we have other questions for Trevor? Yeah, um, there's a question about the anti-racism audit. So, um, you know, we're working with another institution and, uh, and a nonprofit organization to uh, perform an anti-racist um, audit. We're actually starting with our human resources uh, practices. So we're looking at, you know, how do we write our job descriptions? Is there language that we use in our job descriptions that um, you know, suggests uh, that we are less welcoming than uh, we might say we are. Um, where do we advertise our jobs? How do, where and how do we advertise our positions? What happens when the recruitment begins? Um, you know, who's selected for, um, for screening interviews? Who's selected for, uh, on campus, you know, when we have on campus interviews, who's offered the position? Um, what does onboarding look like when someone um, is offered the position and they, they begin working? So, and, and, and with, with this piece, it's, it's a lot of data collecting because a lot of this data, uh, we have this data in, in our HR systems. And so the first part of our audit will be looking at our HR practices, but we are going to be looking at our collections. Are our collections really diverse and representative and, and inclusive? We'll be looking at our communications. So, you know, how, what, what messages do we send in, in our communications? Um, you know, our email correspondence, our, our website, uh, you know, our annual reports, whatever, you know, however we communicate, we'll be, we'll be looking at those. Um, we'll be looking at our policies. So again, thinking about some of these barriers like fees or, you know, one of the things we've already changed, um, you know, we had uh, our, our list of library policies, which was, you know, no food or drink or no this or no that, you know, and I'm sure policies with which many of you are familiar because we probably have similar policies in most of our libraries. And, and while, you know, we, we still want to say those things, we can turn them around in a different way, right? So it's, you know, food and beverages are only allowed in the cafeteria. You may bring, uh, you know, covered bottled, you know, covered beverages into these spaces, except in these spaces, you know, special collections, for example. So um, just, you know, thinking, thinking about the, the, the language, this is about being, being a welcoming space, right? Um, you know, something as simple as, you know, we had a welcome sign, which was printed, uh, which was printed in multiple languages. Um, you know, someone said, oh, you know, my language isn't represented. And so, you know, we took that down and we've moved to a digital sign. Um, a digital welcome sign, which, you know, we can add as many languages as, you know, we want to. It's, you know, it's a simple welcome to the library, right? But it's a welcome to the library in, in many signs. So, um, so we're looking at collections, communication policies, HR practices, um, and there's a fifth, uh, there's a fifth dimension that we'll be looking at that I can't think of offhand. But um, so over the course of the, the year, we'll be, you know, doing these in, in, in chunks. Um, and, and we do hope to, you know, sort of, you know, of course, you know, we're going to publish something about this, but it said, you know, we plan to invite um, other libraries to participate in, in the audit as well. Once we, once we complete the first part of the HR piece and get a sense of how it works and if it works, um, you know, then we'll, we'll invite others to participate. 
And your response certainly indicates how complex a process that work is. Very, very much so. Yeah. Um, can we talk about meeting together as grade level groups to share resources? I have a smattering of offerings on my library webpage. I'm not sure if I understand that question. So perhaps you can um, say a little bit more about that while I move to the next question. Um, can you talk a little bit more about dismant dismantling subscription packages like you mentioned with Elsevier? Um, so uh, yes, our decision to cancel our Elsevier package was entirely a financial decision. Um, although we, um, I had begun conversations with our faculty senate library committee, um, a group of faculty members who provide advice and, and support for the library about open access and um, why we should have a different negotiating tactic with Elsevier once we begun our negotiations next year when they were scheduled to begin. Um, and we probably would have ended up in the same place where we are now canceling our subscription as has happened in so many other institutions who have entered negotiations with Elsevier. Um, but our budget uh, situation was such that we um, just got to that point without the negotiations um, because that was, um, it was a significant savings that helped to reach our budget reduction target without having to have any adverse uh, human resource action. So we didn't have to lay anyone off um, by, by doing that. And, and I still remain committed to um, not laying staff off at the library. So for, for as long as I can. Um, and so far, you know, we've been able to hold off on that. Um, you mentioned reskilling staff. What are your thoughts on staffing from non-MLS candidates to acquire those skills for the library? Um, I, I hope that my use of the language uh, library workers was indicative of the fact that I believe these skills should be uh, developed in everyone who works in the library. I, um, you know, I, I think um, we see a lot of uh, a lot of roles in in library in, in the work that we do that doesn't necessarily require the MLS, um, and and so for the people who uh, work in the library who have or want to develop those skills, then I think we have the responsibility, the obligation, as library leaders to help develop those skills. Um, so that we can get to do the work that we need to get done in the library. So, yeah. um, can we pull resources to scan? Uh, yes. So, um, absolutely. You know, so uh, unfortunately, no longer happening. But you know, the Google Books project was a really great example of the pooled resources. You know, the pooled effort to to digitize material. Um, for those of us who are digitizing material and contributing them to Hadi Trust, you know, again, primarily the academic library community, um, you know, we are contributing material to the Hadi Trust and making those available, um, you know, to others. But I, I think that that, that type of collaboration um, can only serve the the broader community, whether academic or you know, just general community. So. Um, that, that, that type of collaboration is absolutely essential. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that um, than we have been. Our, our budget certainly will require, our, our, budget, our budget situations will certainly require greater collaboration, but it's the right thing to do, even um, you know, budget uh, crunches notwithstanding. And Trevor, I think we have time for just one or two more questions. All right. Um, so uh, the, I can't say which group or nonprofit that we're working with, uh, yet we'll be doing a, an announcement um, later this year on the anti-racism audit. Um, how many staff and resource sharing unit, are they all working from home or on site, or are they splitting time between work and from, they're splitting their time, um, and right now they're doing both physical and, and e-requests. So, um, you know, all our staff, uh, we have about 20% of our staff in the library on any given day, um, but not the same people every day. Um, and so, you know, I only go in twice a week. Today is one of my days when I will actually be in the library after I'm, I'm 
at home right now, but uh, today is one of my manager on duty days. Um, so I'll be going into the library this afternoon, um, but uh, everyone's working just a couple of days a week. Um, as a young professional, so this will be, um, as a young professional to the field, is it difficult trying to determine whether to pursue an MLS or acquire different masters prior to the MLS, depending on job security? Oh, um, so that's a question that I'd be happy to chat with you about offline. You know, I, I think if you've read some of my writings, you'll see I am, uh, you know, I, I certainly believe that there's a lot of value in the, in the MLS and it certainly um, helps to provide a lot of background and grounding in the profession. Um, but I don't think that all the positions in libraries, certainly all the positions in academic libraries, um, which is where I would say I have some expertise, um, require the MLS. So I think it really depends on, you know, the path that you want to take and the type of position that you want to have. But, you know, I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation offline if, if you're interested in chatting more about that. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. I'm sorry that we don't have time to get to every question. Uh, but Trevor, I can't thank you enough for spending your time with us this morning, sharing your story, getting us thinking about these important issues. We know there's so much good and important work still to do. And we thank you for being a part of this important conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you again. We'll now take a break. We will resume our conference at 1030 with session one. We'll see you back here in a few minutes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Trevor.